hit that guy. He shouldn't have been standing there. Despite a bit of a shaky start to the year, indie shooter fans have been eating pretty good lately. With the recent release of Mullet Mad Jack, Salako, Ghostware Arena, not to mention a whole heap of upcoming titles shown off in Steam Next Fest. Too easy. Well, now we've also got another reason to celebrate as well with the release of Fallen Aces' first episode. Yeah man, finally some new content for Trey Powell and Jason Bond's noir themed beat em up that's also part shooter and part immersive sim. <laughs> And you can go and pick this one up on Steam right now, which is something I highly recommend to anyone who's even remotely a fan of this genre. Because despite it being in its very early stages, Fallen Aces is still going to be one of the best indie titles you'll play in 2024. He's kicking our asses. <laughs> so stick around for a bit and let me tell you why that is. Hey, thanks for coming to the party. Right, so what surprised me off the bat here was that Fallen Aces has a surprisingly detailed story. Taking place in the fictional Switchblade City, a city overrun with muggings, murder and live streamers. In the game's opening we see what looks like a prominent public figure being shot and presumably killed. Before then hopping into the worn shoes of private detective Michael Thane. The kind of guy who looks and sounds like he sleeps face down in a pool of day old whiskey and cigarette butts. Ugh. My head. What time is it? Anyway, Mike's quickly informed that a bunch of guys are about to break into his apartment and try to kill him. Before who shows up? What the hell's going on here? Who is your daddy and what does he do? And then after dealing with that, it all becomes about trying to find out why he's being targeted and what's actually causing this sudden escalation of crime in the city. Working alongside a masked vigilante named Nightwave, who seems to have a bit of a vested interest in Mike's survival. You follow local politics much, Detective? And Nightwave's got his own stuff going on as well, trying to uncover the reasons as to why his former buddies, the members of this vigilante group called the Aces, are all getting murdered. So, where to? In between all of the levels, there's these really cool cinematics which play out a lot like the graphic novels from Max Payne, looking like the kind of thing you'd see in a comic book or the cartoon strips in a newspaper, with the colours being kind of blotted and the image slightly faded to replicate that lesser quality texture you got with a newspaper. And the whole thing works surprisingly well, with just enough animated elements in creative panels to keep the whole thing interesting. During the gameplay, the visuals are a combination of 2D sprites mixed with fully 3D and cell shaded environments, again which mostly look like hand drawn textures, along with a lot of really ugly looking no good scumbags just begging to be punched in the face. But even this stuff actually helps to distinguish the kind of enemies you're coming up against, with the unarmed guys always wearing flat caps and turtlenecks, whereas the ones armed with metal pipes or knives have their own individual outfits as well. Come here. What the <laughs> it's definitely reminiscent of earlier games like 13, but I think the whole Art Deco vibe definitely makes Fallen Aces feel way more unique, and I thought that some of these environments were just absolutely gorgeous. A lot of the time I just found myself staring off into the distance and really marvelling at just how much detail they put into this game world. Even as early on as that opening level, how it shows off this humongous glowing cityscape in the background, along with all these various effects like rain and running water. There's a lot of really awesome background music here as well, which helps to capture the tone and time period, and the voice acting throughout all of this is also really funny too. Ah, uh, hey. Hey, where's the freaking Gabagoo? Especially the random chatter you hear from all the enemies. You didn't pay us for this kind of trouble, that's for damn sure. Like hearing one of them get upset after you kill one of their buddies. You killed him! Yeah. Killed him! That was my freaking buddy, you bastard! It's often one of the most overlooked elements in video games, but having enemies with interesting or informative banter during gameplay goes a long way in making the whole thing feel much more immersive, which, you know, really puts the immersive back in immersive sim. Not so tough without that, huh? As for describing the actual gameplay, well, that's pretty simple too. I mean, it's a first person beat em up combined with a first person shooter, giving the player the option of how, when, or even if to engage with enemies. There's an emphasis on using fists and melee weapons, but then there's also lots of ranged weapons to mix things up as well. This should do the job. As for the basic combat, you got a few attack moves, along with a block and a dash to avoid being hit. 
Timer block at just the right time and you'll instead parry, which, you know, seems to be the verbatim mechanic these days. Which stuns an opponent for a few seconds and often sets them up for a powerful finishing move. Come here. A finishing move which restores your health as well, giving us what's more or less a glory kill. Things are looking up for me. You can pretty much throw every single object in the game while that's someone as well, as hard as you want to. From barrels and bits of furniture, even through to explosive propane tanks. Classic. Oh yeah, and check it out, there's even a bar of soap here that can completely demolish whoever gets hit by. Yeah, where have I seen that before? As for the actual shooting, well, that stuff's pretty basic, being little more than just aiming at the thing you want to kill and pressing the fire button. Sadly too lacking that objectively awesome mechanic of being able to check a weapon's available ammo in real time. And look man, I've said it once, but I'll say it again, we need to normalize this feature in video games. Overall, it plays out a lot like Condemned Criminal Origins meets Thief the Dark Project, just with a bit of manhunt thrown in there as well. Mostly in the way that the player can pick up things like metal pipes and planks of wood to fight back with. Oh yeah man, and there's some really vicious weapons in here, like a hammer and a razor blade, both of which were in manhunt by the way. Along with a baseball bat and a fire axe that is completely broken, both of which were in Condemned. And sometimes, you just can't beat the good old board with a nail in it. Oh, he's got a board with a nail in it! <laughs> but even just kicking dudes around can be effective as well, as a means to push them back during combat, or as a more entertaining way to open doors. And if Return of Castle Wolfenstein has taught me anything, it's that that is the supreme way to enter a room. Either way though, you'll be kicking more people around here than Dark Messiah Might Magic where gravity again becomes your greatest ally. Sleep tight, asshole. Not to mention, one level lets you kick people in front of a moving train. The environment can be frequently useful in that way too. I mean, as an example, at one point without even realizing, I kicked a guy into an electrical panel which stunned him and allowed me to finish him off. I'm shocked as you. And much like your mother's crippling herpes, fire in this game has a habit of spreading as well, making it useful for dealing with large groups of enemies if you happen to find a Molotov cocktail. Water, water, the and then the Thief and the Manhunt influence obviously comes in through that rudimentary stealth system, which lets you sneak around and catch out enemies unaware. Once an enemy is knocked out, you can then pick their body up and hide it in a dark corner somewhere, which is one of the all-time classic stealth game tropes. That's the Sleep tight, asshole. It's not the most complex stealth system out there, let's be honest. You're either visible, slightly visible, or completely hidden. And enemies go through the standard unaware, suspicious, or completely alert status where they'll actively chase you down. Um, I hear a rumble! with the diegetic noise of their footsteps and chatter serving as a pretty handy way of tracking their position and staying hidden to begin with. <laughs> Even if you are detected, you can pretty much just run away, and they'll usually return to their original position and suffer some kind of short-term amnesia, completely forgetting that Mike ever existed. Either way though, like the most important takeaway here is that regardless of whether you want to sneak around in the shadows or go in the front door fist blazing, well, the options are there. Kill them. <laughs> How'd you like that? And that's really what I like the most about Fallen Aces, is that it really does contain all the best elements of an immersive sim. That being this completely believable game world with the options and the roots left entirely up to the player. And look, I know people love to gatekeep that term these days as if it's some kind of elusive genre that few games can actually manage to capture. But that's what Fallen Aces really feels like. I mean, let's just look at that very first area in the game. Right after you get off the phone with Nightwave and you're told that a bunch of guys are about to burst in and try to kill you. Yeah, story of my life. Get in line, pal. So your first thought is to probably either find a place to hide or just take these assholes out head on. Both of which work fine. However, you can also just simply smash the window to Mike's office and drop right down to the street level, bypassing the entire building. If you choose to stay inside though, you'll first have to restore power to the elevator to reach the lobby. You kidding me with this shit? Come on! Where, yet again, you've got the option to sneak out through an open skylight and reach the street level, or continue onward to try to get out through the front door. Along too with being given the option to wipe out this new group of patrolling goons, or just avoid them. Just kicking our asses! 
the fourth level is an entire mansion that you've got to sneak into with numerous entry points and options to tackle the dozen or so different patrolling enemies. They even give you a Trank Gun and a very familiar looking Blackjack, you know, just in case it wasn't obvious enough from the get-go what they're taking influence from here. <laughs> and on that note, like, it does kind of seem that there is benefits in going for stealth over outright combat. Simply because if, like, you sneak up behind someone, you can knock them out with a single, well-placed Judo Chop. Judo Chop! And doing this without being seen means you can also pick up their weapon, because otherwise, those things seem to get inexplicably broken. Plus, it also gives you more of an incentive to crawl through all of these pitch black vents. And I mean, look man, if you can't go through a conveniently placed vent that lets you bypass an entire room, like, is it even an imsim? No, no. He's got a point. But that's the great thing about Fallen Aces, is that there's never just one solution to an obstacle. There's always at least two or three different ways you can approach something, and often all of them are gonna work. Kinda helps too that Mike can grapple up most ledges, assuming they're not too high, which gives you a lot of freedom of movement too, making most of the map completely reachable. It's like, yeah man, see that building over there? You can climb it. <laughs> and the constant amount of props and other items you find and interact with along the way really highlights that sandbox feel to the environment. You can go around drinking coffee, eating sandwiches, and in typical tough guy fashion, smoking cigarettes. And about all that's lacking there is the option to go into a toilet cubicle and take a fat shit. Hey, somebody fooling around? The second level is set in this massive opened up dockyard, which really is just like a giant playpen. With all these rooftops and ledges to move around on, and shadows to hide in, and weapons and items just waiting to be found. Hello, darling. And is initially kind of overwhelming, considering you just drop smack bang in the middle and left to fend for yourself. No objective markers in sight either, just people living in the moment. Nightwave can even help you out throughout this map as well, providing cover fire with a sniper rifle. Send him a little lead. Shot. How about some of this? <laughs> and I don't know whether or not the game is going to punish me in the long term for going full lethal, but all I know is, is that there's far too many bad guys standing around explosive propane tanks for my liking here. And look, if I didn't shoot these things and blow these guys up, well, someone else would have. That's all I'm saying. It was at this point as well that I discovered that someone on the dev team has played Prey. Because there's a few puzzles here where you can activate switches from a distance, either by shooting or throwing an object at them. <laughs> but my personal highlight on this level was that before I discovered all of this, I couldn't figure out how I was supposed to get to the other side of the docks. And every time I went into the water, I kept getting attacked by sharks. So, in true immersive sim fashion, what I did was climb up on a nearby rooftop and walk across the cable for the cable car. You know, like it was a tightrope or something. And not only was this viable, but it seemed to be a strategy they'd planned for. Because when I reached the other side of the port, the buildings nearby were high enough that I could drop down without hurting myself. Good, you made it to the other side. It was only later on, after I went back and did a bit more exploring, that I came across a spear gun, and was able to kill those sharks in a single hit, which would have made swimming over to begin with a whole lot easier. Oh well, yeah, and I do want to say as well how much I appreciate how the music when a shark detects you is basically just the theme from Jaws. And while I'm on the subject of movie themes, if you press the interact button when your hands are full, it sounds a hell of a lot like the music from John Carpenter's The Thing. Shit. Anyway, my point here is that it's the stuff like this that makes it all seem like these elements have been put in there with an actual purpose. Like the inventory limit only being able to hold three items at once, kinda seems like it's putting a damper on the fun factor, but in reality it's probably just done that way to force you to commit to a certain playstyle. I mean if you could just carry every single weapon at once along with spare ammo and a bunch of medkits, well then there'd be nothing interesting or challenging about how you approach a puzzle, because you could instantly just whip out the right tool for the job, that's what she said. But forcing yourself into carrying a particular set of items, it really makes you want to play within those limitations, and either adapt or rethink your approach. And even then, like if you get too fucked up, you can always just reload a manual save file and give the whole thing another crack. The one thing that I will criticize here is that this game is way, way too easy, even on the so-called hard mode. Sneaking around and taking out the bad guys and then just picking off the stragglers if you're detected is really effective. But even then, like, if you are overwhelmed, there's usually so many props or weapons that you can easily just defend yourself anyway. 
There's so many guns in the game too, and even if you don't spend the extra time looking around, you're not going to be short of ranged options there either. And those moments when you do have a fully loaded pistol or revolver just make the combat laughably easy, because enemies have no sense of self-preservation either. Just running straight towards you, despite you having just mowed down a bunch of their buddies with a goddamn Tommy gun. Don't you like that? Oh. All right. In the third level, there's a sequence where you're putting down tripwire explosives, and the bad guys are just gonna walk right on through them without a second thought. There is at least a pretty cool roster of weapons here, from the revolver and the pistol, even through to a nail gun, which feels like a reference to the one in Manhunt, along with an incredibly overpowered hand cannon and then a sworn off and pump action shotgun, both of which can completely jib enemies in more or less a single hit which just makes it way too easy to wipe out an entire group of goons in seconds. So I do kind of wish that there was more of a rarity when it comes to these ranged weapons and ammunition. Kind of like how it was in Condemned Criminal Origins, which Fallen Aces no doubt takes a lot of influence from. I mean in that game when you came across a fully loaded pistol or shotgun, like that was an actual event and you really wanted to make sure you didn't miss a single shot, knowing how precious and hard to come by ammo could be. In Fallen Aces though, I always seem to have a pistol, a nail gun, or something similar, often with half a dozen spare rounds nearby too, which as Revolver Ocelot would put it, is more than enough to kill anything that moves. More than enough to kill anything that moves. At one point in the third level, I found a sniper rifle in a closet inside an abandoned building, and picking off the bad guys in the nearby street was like shooting fish in a barrel. Honestly, to the point that I stopped using it just so there was some semblance of challenge. I mean, on a positive note, it does kind of show you just how freely you can map out your own personal playstyle. And look, I know that complaining about a game rewarding you for exploration and experimentation does seem kind of dumb. But I don't know, like I guess my point is that I just wish the stakes felt a bit higher. Because if I'm able to wipe out the enemies regardless of whether or not they actually see me, well, then what's the incentive to stay hidden all the time? I don't know, maybe the solution is they can add in a tougher difficulty mode which reduces the amount of resources. The other thing I'd highlight as well is the money mechanic and its overall purpose. Now, to add each of the levels, you can find loot and cash hidden away in safes or random hidey holes. Nice. I needed some booze money. But outside of buying stuff from vending machines like soda or cigarettes, there doesn't seem to be any reason to hoard this stuff away. I kept expecting there to be some kind of vendor who'd sell me better guns or items or let me upgrade my stats, you know, something like that. Someone who had a lot of good things on sale, maybe. What are you buying? But instead, I just ended up using it as pocket change. I should probably point out as well that there's some issues when it comes to the hit detection, with objects often passing through enemies entirely. And I noticed this one the most when I was trying to throw objects at people, which is pretty glaring to witness. What? I've also had a few issues with the stealth at times, where there's spots in a level that feels like you should be hidden, where it really feels like you're out of the light, but for some reason that doesn't seem to register. Like this bit here for instance, where I'm very clearly standing in a darkened corner in a dimly lit room, and yet it's not really registering that I'm in the shadows. But the absolute biggest problem this thing has though, is the content or current lack thereof. And look, I get it that this is the way a lot of these indie games are forced to go these days, being developed through what's more or less just continuous crowdfunding, where you're not so much buying a game, but investing your trust in a developer and a product that'll come out at a later date. But it does suck to think that yet again we're playing another indie title that is still unfinished. Can't wait to try out this new sticker. <laughs> this first episode of Fallen Aces is broken down into five levels, with each level taking anywhere from half an hour to an hour to complete, depending on how long you want to spend with it. I mean, honestly, you could spend hours on each of these if you really wanted to, exploring every single nook and cranny. But let's just say realistically, most people for a first time playthrough are gonna finish these levels in 30 to 60 minutes. So if this is the same structure they're taking with the whole game, which I'm assuming they will, well then you're easily looking at a 10 to 15 hour experience across the entire three episodes, which is fine. What you're getting here though, today with this current version, however, is far less than that. No respect. No siree. I guess the good thing is that the price they're asking for this is absolutely more than fair. Still though, I think it's something worth considering. 
So if that premise isn't an issue to you personally, well then by all means man, pick this one up. Like I said at the start of the video, I do highly recommend it. As much as I recommend putting on a pair of pants before you leave the house. At the end of the day though, what's here in Fallen Aces is still pretty damn good, with no doubt the rest of the content to follow to be of an equally high standard as well. It's just a matter of when we're actually going to get to play it. Either way though, a lot of time, effort and talent has clearly been put into this thing. And even in these early days, it's still brimming with soul, charm and character. That's kind of the good thing as well about a company like New Blood having such a broad spectrum of devs and people working on these games, in that all of them are so different and unique to play through. You fellas are starting to piss me off. Until someone else makes a noir themed game that lets me deck wise talking mooks with my bare hands or deatomize them with explosive propane tanks, well then Fallen Aces is about as good as it's gonna get. So go check it out, you filthy animal. Keep the change, you filthy animal.